Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so we have uh, started the class officially now, and uh, we are recording. Uh, so uh, today we have uh, Professor Kasarch, a yeah. great quarter for the book that you have it, and hopefully you will read and enjoy the book. And yeah, and here uh, he's uh, yeah. Please uh, mute all. Yeah, uh, please unmute when you want to talk. Uh, I, I think, uh, Bill, you need to also unmute yourself. Got it. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, great. Uh, and, and we started uh, about approximation algorithms, and we mentioned, I mean, some classes of approximation algorithm for both minimization and maximization. And uh, today, uh, I mean, and we talk about uh, mean rep and max rep, two versions of label cover. Uh, which are important for unique game and the PCP theorem. And uh, here, Professor Kasach this week talks about them more and uh, about the approximation algorithm and the hardness for them. And I think uh, you have the, I mean, the scene built. So you can start and if you want, you can share the screen now. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mohamed. I am pleased to be here. I'm also happy to be here on Zoom since it's eight in the morning. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah. So today I'll talk about the uh, complexity class PCP because that will help us get a lower bound on approximating the clique problem and either today or next lecture also a uh, max set problem. Um, before I begin that, let me just say generally, um, in 1993 or so, before, before that, they were working on a different way to characterize NP that will help us to actually show lower bounds on approximation. And it was a very big breakthrough in 93 when they actually had what was what I now call the PCP theorem, which I'll get to later. The point is though that it is a very hard theorem. Proving this theorem could be an entire course or maybe a month of a course. We're not gonna do that. We're gonna take the theorem as given as a black box and then use it to prove lower bounds on approximation. Um, in fact, this goes along with, if I was to write a book on approximations, which I don't think I'm going to have a book again for this book, but I would call it, um, you know, the mentality is assume as a black box and very hard theorems, and from those, prove lower bounds. So my, my book's title would be Proving uh, proving, hardness, proving Hardness Approximation the Easy Way, but Leaving Out the Hard Parts. So I'll leave out the really hard part, but even with the PCP as a black box, there's work to do of interest to prove lower bounds on today, click. But let's actually get, get on with it, though. I'm going to actually view NP a different way. So my first part of the talk will be uh, not, not no, no theorems in it. I mean, no proofs in it. Just getting setting the stage for how to redefine NP in a different way. So first off, what is NP? NP can be viewed as on the slide here. Um, a is an NP if there's a B in P. A is all X, so there exists a short string Y, X, Y, and B. Uh, we're going to re rewrite that. Uh, so the intuition, of course, is that Alice is trying to convince a polynomial, uh, so bounded Bob, that X is an A. And if X is an A, Alice can send Bob the witness and usually say a satisfying assignment, for example. So Alice can say, hey, Bob, this assignment satisfies it. And Bob can verify that quickly. And notice, of course, that the satisfying assignment is short and the verification is easy. And at the end, uh, Bob is sure X is an A. And if X is not an A, then whatever Alice sends, Bob's not buying it. Bob, you know, uh, no matter how powerful A is, Alice is, um, Bob is, yeah, it's, it's, A, A is not for Alice, but no matter how powerful Alice is, um, she cannot convince Bob of something false. Okay, so um, we modify it. So notice a few things. First off, Bob gets to read the entire string Y, the entire satisfying assignment. Secondly, Bob uses a deterministic algorithm and Bob is never wrong. Now, you know, <clears throat> sorry, you know all these things, but I'm, I'm pointing them out as facts because I'm going to actually uh, change all of them. What if Bob only got to read a little bit of Y, or some of Y, half of Y, uh, a tenth of Y, log n bits? What if Bob was able to use a randomized algorithm? And what if Bob was wrong, uh, was allowed to be wrong a fraction of the time? So this is going to lead to what might look like a new complexity class, the hard theorem was that it still equals NP, but I'll do that later. 
So uh, I'm going to do an example. Yeah, okay, okay. I'm going to do an example soon, but you see what I'm getting at so far. Questions. As always, I welcome questions. Okay. Now, um, so Alice wants to convince Bob that this formula is in 3SAT. Okay. So here is uh, informally what they might do, given my modifications on the last slide. Alice, okay, well, th this is a normal thing. Alice sends Bob a truth assignment. Uh, Bob, ah. Now, doesn't really send them a truth assignment. It's more like Bob can actually look at a small part of the truth assignment. So I, my one's not quite right. My point is, Alice says to Bob, um, I will give you some three log n or some small subset of the truth assignment. And Bob will randomly pick log n clauses. That's less equal to three log n variables. And Bob will just look at the partial assignments on those clauses. And if the assignment on those clauses makes all log n clauses true, then Bob thinks, well, it looks pretty good that phi is probably in SAT. He'll say yes. He could be wrong. And uh, however, if one of the clauses, uh, Alice's assignment is not satisfied, Bob says with confidence, no, 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 not satisfiable. Okay, so um, first off, do we understand this uh, protocol? Your thoughts? Don't be shy. It's, you know, I know it's eight in the morning, but we're here. It's great. Okay. Um, do you think this will work? Do you think this will work most of the time? I want your thoughts on that. Will this do well? Will, will, will Bob make errors often or not? Okay, let me actually ask more uh, direct question. Um, what kind of formulas do you think this will do well on and what kind will it do badly on? That is, um, if it is satisfiable, yeah. What kinds of formulas might fool Bob? Okay. Um, I demand somebody give me some response on that. Maybe a formula that is uh, unsatisfiable at one class. Ah, got it. So you're, you're saying a formula where it's mostly satisfiable, say. Yeah. Yeah, we, good, good point. Yes, if you can satisfy all but one clause, indeed, then um, then probably you you can probably fool Bob. Because most of the time, Bob will pick all those login clauses that, that those are satisfiable. Okay, and um, somebody else tell me a uh, formula which might Bob might do well on. Formula that is lots of copies of the same clause. Ah, very good. Okay, uh, and so that let's see now. Oh, okay, gotcha. So yeah, I hadn't thought of that. That's a good point. Yep, that would that would do very well. Okay, and um, so let's see. For, for, okay, if he is in SAT, the protocol works fine. If he is not in SAT, yes, uh, indeed, as the uh, other student said. If you can satisfy all but one clause, this will almost surely will fool Bob. Um, uh, let's see, not be in three sat and the max number of clauses satisfied. Oh yes, if the max number of clauses satisfied is not that large. If if it's hard to satisfy over, if you really can't satisfy any more than half the clauses, that's actually impossible. But okay, let's say it was the case. Then the oh yeah, let's let's just say you would only satisfy five clauses. Then the protocol will do quite well. Um, although that really can't happen. Anyway, so, but the thing is, though, again, I, I'm not taking this seriously as a protocol of any sort, but this is an idea. Let me go back again. This is, this is the kind of protocol I'm talking about. The one that actually works is much more complicated than this. This one doesn't work, work at all, really. But this is the kind I'm talking about. So notice that Bob only looks at a small part of the assignment, and Bob acts randomly, and Bob has, well, in this case, a large probability of error but the thing is, Bob indeed can err. So happy with this example. Okay. Okay. Oh yes. So um, it, we're, maybe we're too small for a breakout room. So just every, everybody unmute and try to give me a similar protocol for a three color for three colorability. Okay. I want everyone to unmute and talk loudly. I want to see fist fights. Well, kind of harder to zoom. Um, so your thoughts on three call, so similar protocol. Anybody, give me a similar protocol. Folks, come on, wake up. How about we randomly select several edges instead okay. of several clauses in the set protocol? Okay, very good. So you select several edges. Okay, so Bob selects several edges, and what does Alice send him? 
Oh uh, yeah. What? Oh yeah, right. And then Bob will check whether the the endpoints of those edges are uh, colored differently. Got it. So Alice, so he looks at so he looks at a coloring just those edges. Very good. And do you think they'll and okay, that, that that's correct. Do you think that's a good protocol? Or is it, is it the set protocol was not very good? Is yours any better? Uh, I don't think so. I think they they have the same problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely right. That's right. They're the same problem. Um, and yeah, and that okay, that's correct. Okay, and in fact, that's what I did do. Uh, Alice sends Bob row with three coloring. Or actually, again, that doesn't send it. Yeah, uh, actually, you said yeah, login edges fine. And uh, actually, I meant to say login vertices. Oh, it doesn't really matter much. And then uh, fee prime, uh, row prime is row just on those endpoints. And indeed. If row prime is a proper three coloring of the subgraph, the small subgraph Bob looks at, he can say yay. And um, if row prime is not a proper three, three coloring, then whatever Alice does, yeah, then he, he knows it's not three colorable. Okay, very good. So um, that's three color. And I, I want to more examples, but the thing is, this is uh, this is one way of trying to view NP and trying to sort of modify NP. These three ways. Um, Bob is randomized. Bob looks at only a small part of the witness, and Bob can be wrong. Although the, the hope is that uh, have protocol where he's right, where he's right more often. Okay. Now, so um, now I'll go into doing this a bit more formally. I'll try to be. I'll try to be too formal. I'll try, I'll try not to be. I'll try not to be too formal. So, what is a poly oracle Turing machine bit access? That's a mouthful. Uh, Potum BA still a mouthful. It's a polynomial term machine, which has the following properties. Uh, well, it has a state called query. So that will, that will be like inquiring, oh, what is bit 84 of the assignment, say? Okay. It'll have a tape called the query tape. It'll be a tape called the answer tape. And we'll denote this device by M with brackets on it on top. We'll, we're thinking of putting, the, in our case, for our example, put the string of the coloring in those brackets. And here's what you do. Given a string y, call the oracle. And again, think of it being, say, a satisfying assignment. And input x, you can, we can compute m with oracle y on input x is as follows. You run the machine. Whenever it goes into a query state, then a number is written down on the query tape, say, 84. And then the 84th bit appears on the tape by magic. So um, so it's, it's a Turing machine. It's a, it's, a, it's a Python program, whatever you want it to be. Uh, you move left, you, you do assignments, you do equals, you do you pick whatever. You then um, go into a state called the query state. You then write in some register a uh, sequence of bits and say it's 84. You then get back the 84th bit of Y. Um, and you might use that to go on and do other things. Okay. So, um, oh, yes. I am not going to find this formally, but this is, first off, all this can be made formal. I'm not going to do that. But this really is what you were doing before, and it, you were doing this before. Actually, well, yeah, before in our protocol for satisfiability, um, and also for three, for three coloring, you were doing this. Although we also had randomization, you flipped coins. You then asked, "Hey, what is what is assigned to x five?" And you would find the answer out, and you then move along some more and say, oh, "Okay, hmm, what's assigned to x seven?" And move along some more, and then at the end, I'll put yes or no. Okay, so, are you happy that? Are you happy with this definition and that it can be made formal? And again, I'm not going to. I am not going to do that, but it could be. Happy with that? And it pins down what we've been doing. Okay. Now notice, though, this is actually still deterministic. I'm going to actually make it randomized. And um, why define a concept one way when you can define it two ways? This is one of the annoying things about math in general. There are two different definitions for this. They're equivalent. One is much more intuitive, and the other one is better for proofs. It's kind of annoying, but I'll give you both of them, and you'll see they're equivalent anyway. It's not that hard. Okay, so randomized. Um, let's see, definition one. This is probably what you're thinking of when you think of randomized algorithms. Yeah, when I say randomized algorithm, you're thinking of an algorithm which will, correctly, um, in its uh, while it's moving along, flip a coin, and based on the coin flip, do something. So, um, so a random, an R-P-O-T-M, blah, B-A, uh, Ropatom, not a very good acronym, I can't really pronounce it. Anyway, it is 
one of these devices that also flips coins. And in that case, we care about the probability that, you, that it accepts. Uh, we, can, we can't really say it accepts or does not accept. Look at the probability. Um, and um, let's see now. Okay, yeah, that'd be the probability based on Y. But we'll, we'll get to that later. And definition two are the coin flips are part of the input. So rather than say, I move along, definition one is I compute stuff, flip a coin, based on the answer, compute more stuff, et cetera, fine. And um, a definition two would be, oh, sorry, it's not based on why, the randomization is based on the random coins, of course. But the definition two though is rather than say, I'll uh, flip a coin in the middle of computation, I already have the coin flips pre-planned. So the input is X and, it's a, it's a deterministic machine with input X and a sequence of coin flips. So definition two is the input is a satisfying assignment. So, no, sorry, the input is a satisfy, is a formula that I care about and also heads, heads, tails, tails, heads, heads, tails. And I will use that sequence uh, in my computation. So this is purely deterministic. And tau is a string of coin flips. Uh, oh, and here we also care. We also will care about uh, random, randomization. That is, given a random tau, how well does this actually work? So, do we understand? Do we see and understand these two definitions? Okay. Uh, realize I know Zoom is hard and impersonal, but to make it better, respond to me when I ask a question, even to say yes, that's good, or no, that's bad, or whatever. So. Random person, uh, Rochelle, happy with this? Is Ru Russ Hill, Dan, the I can't pronounce your name. Unmute and tell me if you're happy or not. Okay, how about unmute and tell me if you're there or not? Well, I'll turn the uh, Joseph Carolan, are you there? Hey, yeah, hey. I think that okay. makes sense. Okay, very good. Okay, so are you happy with this? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, very good. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, gee, this is a strange way of looking at NP and stuff, but how is it going to help us? Is that what you're thinking? Yes. Oh, that, that's, that's a fair thought. And again, unfortunately, well, probably fortunately or unfortunately, I don't have you it. I will give you a theorem about these devices, a very hard theorem, and then use that. So there is going to be a sort of Rather big two month gap in my talk based on a very hard paper, but yes, but it will be helpful. You'll see. Okay, now also uh, we can even go back and define NP in terms of these POTMs, uh, kind of silly thing to do, but we can do it, which is going to be if X is an A, uh, then there exists um, a machine. Uh, like I said, uh, A is an NP if there is one of these devices, so X is an A implies. There's a polynomial length y, m y of x equals one. This is nothing, this is pretty much the same as before, just y is, all we're saying is y is satisfying assignment and we're viewing it as the oracle for a potum ba. And x not name implies that for all y, there isn't one, fine. Okay. Now, um, the standard interpretation is if x is an a, we think of y as being the evidence that x is an a. You want to prove to me, you want to tell me that some formula is satisfiable, Give me the evidence in terms of a satisfying assignment. The evidence is short, only p of x long, and the computation is quick, uh, only polynomial. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, oh. Here it's not that interesting for our framework because you do get to look at all the bits. So um, we would have. Okay, we're going to instead restrict the number of bits in the oracle, uh, and use a randomized machine, and I didn't, I didn't put it here, and also keep track of the probability of error. Okay, this is getting repetitive, so let's go on. Okay, now, uh, oh yeah, parameters. So we have a uh, one of these devices. I want to know three things. I want to know how many bit queries they're going to ask. In the example of uh, satisfiability before, it was three log n. So how many bit queries you're asking? And I want to know how many random bits you're using. So Q of n and R of n will be monotonically increasing functions, things like log n or whatever. Um, Okay, and here we have it, a Q of N, R of, uh, a Q of N query, R of N random, um, R potum, is an R potum, where for all X, uh, X is N, M, Y of X makes Q of N bit queries, or less, and flips the coin R of N times. Okay, that's fine. This is a good definition. I haven't told you 
Uh, I haven't told you the probability. We, we now have to also quantify the probability that it actually accepts. But this is a fine definition, rigorous even, um, of a randomized pattern. So, um, uh, new question. Amin, happy with this? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, very good. And are, are you much like Joseph? Are you, are you also wondering, well, this is all great. This is all fascinating, Bill, but how is it going to help us? Is that your thought? Yeah, I did. That's, that's a fair thought. Um, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Now, um, yeah. So, uh, by the way, I will warn you, it's, um, it's been said, if the number of definitions is twice, if the number of time spent in definitions is twice that of the theorems, something's gone wrong. But, alas, that probably is what we're doing today. Okay. So, um, Q of N and R of N are mono-increasing. Epsilon of N is mono-decreasing from N to zero, one. So, that'll be our probability of error. And we now want to have a definite, now here's our big definition, a language A, like satisfiability perhaps, is in PCP, Q of N, R of N, Epsilon of N, if there's a Q of N query, R of N random, R bottom, so that for all X, the following happens. If X is an A, then there is some Y, some Oracle, so no matter what random bits you use, you're going to accept. Think, ah, satisfiability, the Oracle is satisfying assignment, and even if you were to pick clauses at random, you would always accept. If X is not an A, here's where it differs from our previous things. If X is not an A, then for all Y, there are at most epsilon of N sequences of coin flips that make you accept. Oh, so um, I'm saying here, this is probably not going to be like SAT, probably, but it's going to be something like, oh, aha, we have, well, let's be, let's be very concrete here. Let's just say R of N was just like 100. So we have 100 coin flips to have two to the 100 different sequences. Let's make, let's make it 10. So I can, there are 10 coin flips. So there are 1,024 possibilities for the randomness. I want it to be the case that say for three quarters of them, yeah, if X is not an A, then three quarters of those 10 bit coin flips, yeah, for, no matter what Y you pick, no matter what Oracle you try to uh, run by me, for at least three quarters of the sequences of coin flips, it's going to correctly say no. So the probability of error is smallish, is the idea. So um, happy with that. Okay. Uh, Ejwar, happy with this? Yeah. Very good. Now, okay, and now a few notes on, I've left out a few details here, which are a little bit important, is, um, so if A is in Q of N, R of N, Epsilon of N, you ask a query, and based on the query, you can branch and ask something else. Like, oh, if the query, if the 84th bit is one, I'll do blah, and end up maybe querying uh, the 88th bit. If the 84th bit is zero, I'll do something else, and end up querying the 17th bit. That is, the queries are adoptive. Later queries can depend on earlier queries' answers. Okay, so yeah, so here's, as I said, uh, M, Y of X calculation, they're made adoptively. The second question may depend on the first question. So what's of interest to us is, what is the total number of questions you could ask? So I'll, I'll, I'll ask you this. Okay, so let's take my example. If, you have, if you're allowed to make 10 queries, say, you know, yeah, say you can make five queries, then if you look at every single oracle and every single way the calculation could go, how many different questions could, could be asked? I'm not, it's not rhetorical, I'm asking you the question. I'm asking you, I have uh, one of these devices, it can make five, uh, say, say it's deterministic, it can make five queries. So um, if I run this on every single Y, um, and what is the total number of possible queries it could, uh, it, it could make? No, sorry, let, let me say it again. If you fix Y um, and you don't run the machine ahead of, Fix Y. Aha, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run M with this particular Y. Before I run it, I'm kind of curious. Well, um, the first query could be yes or no. And based on that, I can get a second query. So what is the total number of queries I could be looking at if I wanted to simulate it? Your thoughts. Go ahead. You will do the five minus one. Uh, actually, just, just do the five. Yes, do the five. Uh, 32. 32, indeed. OK. Um, and in fact, yes, here we go. If you drew out the entire tree computations, branching it every way, you actually could, you, you could act, and, and, oh, if you branch for every query, and I did this earlier, every random bit, 
you would actually have two to the Q of n, is what you said, plus R of n, possible questions. So realize it's, all, it's not just the queries, also the random bits. So we're happy that, aha, there are two to the Q of n plus R of n, possible questions. Happy with that? And this is important because we're not going to have the Y. We're going to simulate a Y. We're going to say, hmm, um, I'm going to say I do the calculation. I get to a question. So I get to a random bit. I'll look at both possible ways it could have gone. I'll look at a query. I'll look at both possible ways it could have gone. I could actually do an entire tree of comp computations and find out, oh, um, here is everything that could have happened. Again, without having Y, I can actually still look at everything that could have happened. But is 2 to the Q of n plus R of n large? What do you think? Is it too large to actually do the simulation? So yeah, so here's my scenario. Aha, I have one of these devices. I don't know what Y is, but I'm curious what could possibly happen. So, um, I, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually run the machine, and whenever I get to a random uh, randomization step or a query step, I'm going to branch both ways and look at the entire tree of comp computations. Will that be a horrendously hard task? What do you think? Your thoughts? Not if they are at most logarithmic. Ah, okay, indeed. It depends on how big Q of N R of N R. That's correct. And in fact, okay, yeah, first off, um, before anything else, I can essentially take the length of Y to be 2 to the Q of N plus R of N. And as you said, if Q of N and R of N are both O of log N, then length of Y is poly in N. So that's good. And that will be the case uh, most of the time. Actually, this or, or, or even less. Um, so there will be times we can simulate all possible paths of this machine and then look at, aha, it looks like for three quarters of the path they accepted, say. Okay. So, oh yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Simulating a PCP. Uh, yes, we can simulate it. Uh, well, no. Uh, but okay. We don't know why, whatever. But there are two ways to look at this. Either for all random tau and all bit sigma, do a simulation. So, okay, fix tau, fix, oh, let's just say I do, um, let's see now, uh, what are tau and Say, I'm going to do bit sequence 1101. Oh, yeah, say so queries. I'm going to answer queries. Yes, yes, no, no, yes. I'll do random bits 11110 one, one, um, and simulate. I can certainly do that. Or, and then keep track of, ah, here's what I want to do. So, let me be more, be, let me be more, more careful here. So um, I'm going to do the following. Aha, for every single sequence of uh, Q of N random bits, oh, sorry, Q of N query bits and R of N random bits, I am going to simulate. Aha, if I use yes, yes, no, yes, blah, 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 it says, it says yes. If I do 111001, whatever, whatever, it says no. Keep track of them. And here's a very important concept. Um, two different simulations could be consistent or inconsistent. Here's the point. Let's just say that um, uh, Kelvian, is that your name? Kelvian? Oh, no, Kaivin. K-E-I-V-A-N. How do you pronounce that? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, very good. Very good. So, uh, so okay, and how do you say your name? Kayvon. Kayvon, very good. Kayvon, you simulate, and in your simulation, using some sequence of bits, you end up answering query 84 with a yes. That can happen, correct? Mm -hmm. And Sohu does a different random sequence of bits, and he ends up answering uh, bit 84 with a no. So that in that case, your two strings are inconsistent. It's not a bad thing. I'm just saying they are. However, it's possible that you, Kevian, only ask queries 84, 87, and 94, answering them yes, yes, no, and that Sohu also uh, answers 84 and other things, not those, but on the one place or two places they actually ask the same query, they actually agree. That could happen. It's possible that Kivian simulation and Soho's are consistent with each other, only meaning on the queries they ask, on the queries that they have in common, and there may be zero of them, but on the queries they have in common, they agree. So if they don't have any queries in common, they're certainly consistent, but, more, but also, you know, if they have five, seven, whatever queries in common, if they answer the same way to those five or seven queries, then the simulations are consistent. So uh, it's going to be important later on, given a sequence of tau, of, of tau 
randomization and sigma bit answers, run all the run the simulation, do that for all tau and sigma, and then say, oh, then group these in categories of, oh, these were all consistent with each other and these were not. So one could do that. One can actually have an equivalence class of sequences sigma tau based on whether or not they were consistent or not. So I'm happy that you could do that. So uh, uh, Kayvon, happy that you could do that? Yeah. Kayvon, would you want to do that? No. That is, fortunately, we will, we will talk about doing these things and prove theorems. We're not going to actually do these things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, and indeed, and again, because R of n and Q of n will be logarithmic, you could do these things. Okay, okay we will do this in our proof that clique is hard to approximate. Okay, so, um, and we're going to actually find, uh, okay, so for all, uh, oh yeah, for all, ta uh, okay, sorry. I said there are two ways to look at this. One is run all simulations and then do equivalence classes and see if perhaps you have a large set of simulations that all agree with each other, say, that, that all are consistent and say yes, for example. Okay. Another way, way you can look at it, which is used for MaxSat, is the following. For all, just fix the random bit. So um, you have a random sequence of bits, uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, and then some Boolean sequences lead to accept and some lead to reject. And so we're going to want to actually say, hmm, I'm going to write down a formula, which is true if and only if um, it actually leads to accept. Okay. For that one, actually, you'll need R of n equals O of log n bits, but also you'll need even less query bits. You'll need O of 1 query bits to make that actually work. That we'll probably do maybe next lecture. But the point is, though, uh, let's today just concentrate on the first one, which is you have sequences of, you simulate, all, you, you do all simulations and see if you have a large set that are consistent with each other and all say yes. Okay, so happy with that. Okay. I have a question. Go ahead. I have a question. Go ahead, go ahead. So, um, so is, it, is it possible for, for like uh, two simulation, uh, for like uh, A to be consistent with B and B to be consistent with C, but A not being consistent with C because there might be like some. Oh, let's see, I hadn't thought of that. Um, aha. I suppose it is. So I think my saying equivalence classes, ah, yep, that That's could happen. Not... That could happen. So I should not have said the word equivalence class. I'll just say that some, all I'll say for now is that some pairs of things uh, are consistent and some are not. Good, good point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Very good. But we, we will be interested in having um, a large set that are, are all pairwise consistent with each other. So that will be interested in the case where, well, I'll tell you now, actually, it turns out if the graph has a large clique, you're going to have a very large set that are all consistent with each other. And that'll be a good thing. Okay. And now some, finally, some theorems, which I'll state but not prove because they're hard. Okay, theorem. SAT can be done with a PCP with O of 1 query bits. That's not that many. Wow. O of log n random uh, bits and probability to ha a half of uh, being wrong. Uh, a half doesn't sound that good, but do you think, uh, even though it's a hard theorem, do you think we can even just use this theorem to actually improve? The probability. Yes. How, okay. We, Very good. How? We can repeat the process. Right. And accept if or no if uh, we have a positive answer for all of them. Yeah. If, if both accept. Yes. Okay. Indeed. More generally, and you're, that's how you do this by iterating part one. You can actually drive it down to one tenth, one over a hundred, one over a thousand. Whatever you want, constant, because the iteration, had the, the iteration, <coughs> sorry, this requires taking only a constant number of iterations, but you could do that. So therefore, the O of log n, it just becomes part of the O of log n term. Or we'll also need this. Um, if we actually iterate at log n times, we can get apps down to 1 over n. But that, that has a cost, though. That's going to give us log squared uh, random bits. So... Uh, two is very good, but the, the probability is that not, not is even though the probability is like one over a thousand, not quite good enough. We're going to need something which does probability of error like one over n, but we don't really want log. Remember, I said earlier we want r of n and q of n to be log n. This is not quite, we, we can't quite use this either because, yeah, we can't use two for a clique lower bound because we, we're going to need a probability of like one over n. We can't use three for the clique lower bound. 
because we kind of need a random number of random bits to be uh, like log n. So, um, so one is a hard theorem, two and three follow from one, but not quite what we need. But four is a harder theorem, again, a hard theorem, O of log n. It turns out that for clique, it's okay to have O of log n query. So O of log n query bits, O of log n random bits, one over n. That was a, obviously it was based on the first proof, but it's again, a hard theorem, uh, one over n. And in fact, um, they found a clever way to reuse random bits, which uh, sounds a bit odd, but they could do it. Anyway, so um, this is the end of my first packet of slides. And having said all this, all you need to know for packet two, which is clique, is going to be that sat is in PCP, O of log n, O of log n, comma one over n. And you must know what that means. So before I switch slides, uh, do we understand what it means to say? And again, I'm not asking you to prove it. Um, I would not make it a homework assignment. Oh, that'd be nasty, wouldn't it? Homework assignment, prove, sat is in, O of log n, O of log n, one over n. Do we understand the statement and what it means? Not the proof that sat is in PCP, O of log n, O of log n, one over n. Happy with that. Again, don't be shy. Uh, this might be a dumb question, but not, can wait, you explain? Oh, stop. This is very hard stuff. It's not a dumb question. Go ahead. Uh, for like point one, um, yes. why does this not give us a polynomial algorithm for sat? Oh, okay. oh no, first of all, that's an excellent question. Um, because one thing, is, one thing we have the probability here. The thing is, we're not we're not sure of our answer. That is okay. The thing is, you're thinking of you're thinking of you're thinking of okay. Give give me your proposed algorithm. Um, so something like iterate over all possibilities for the uh, random bits. Yep. And iterate over all possibilities of the oracle. Okay, that's true. And, and then, um, and let's try oh, that. Okay, okay, okay. I think I see oh, the no, problem. No, 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 let me extend on that. And you'll do all that. And some of the computations say yes, some say no. But the thing is, though, sat is in sat. It's satisfiable if there exists one y that says yes all the time. You're saying, oh, I looked at all the y's and all the sequences of the random bits. Uh, and some said yes, some said no. But even if a lot of them say no, you'd have to figure out was there some y that always said yes. Let's see now. So you could look at all. But it's still polynomial, right? Okay, well, let's, find, let's, let's think about that. So if you actually, let's look at every single y as a candidate. Okay, let's say it's O of 1. Let's, just, let's say it's actually um, 12 bits, 12, 12 query sequence. I could look at all two of the 12 query sequences, certainly. And for each one, look at all log n. Um, Look at all log n um, random bits. Let's see now. Um, and okay, if you find one y that actually works, my gosh, Mohammed, he's proven p equals np. <laughs> we can stop looking at our book. <laughs> okay. um, so seriously, well, these are very subtle points. Let me get back to you. Let me get back to you on that next week. Before I convince myself of p equals np. Let me get back to you on that next week, okay? Oh, no, okay sure, sure. Yeah, no, but it's a, it's a, it's a fair subtle point about the, about the, the definition there. So I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Okay, very good point. Okay, more thoughts. Uh, Professor, can you explain uh, how iterating can reduce the uh, Yeah, okay, probability. Look, the thing is, because let's say if you have a probability one half, let's just say you run it twice. And okay, so if I get a, um, let's say my problem is, what if I get a positive answer? I'm, I'm never sure that I'm never sure it's, it's quite right. Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, I get a positive. So I, I run this. I get a positive answer. Uh, I'm probably half. I run it twice. I get positive answers twice, two times. Then the problem is only, only one quarter of being wrong. Okay. So square. Okay. So it's, it's iteration. Yeah. It's not, it's not hard. Okay. Very good. Okay. Also, I will say for both questions, by the way, realize I'm leaving out of math of details here. But yes, yeah, so that's how it basically, basically, basically works. Okay. okay, more thoughts. Okay. I, I guess this is uh, uh, harder, but how can we reuse the random bits? Oh, gosh, <laughs> that is harder. <laughs> um, no, it, ha it has to. I will tell you the buzzword I've heard. It has to do with taking a random walk on an expander graph. So people can create expander graphs, um, which are, there are graphs that have essentially low degree but high connectivity and you can construct these things using a few random bits and once you have this from like log n random bits you can actually construct an expander graph and then if you do a log n walk on the expander graph 
that manages to give you, uh, here's the key point, not, ra- not truly random bits, but bits that are random enough. Thing is, in all these things, one thing I haven't quite told you is that I've been pr- portraying this, and it's good pedagogically, as these are truly random bits. You don't quite need truly random. You just need random enough to fool a polynomial device. So with that, you can actually get by, get by with less of them. That is, you use a small number of bits to create, you use a small number of truly random bits to create a larger set of, you might say, mostly of poly, poly random bits. So oh. if, if, yeah, I'll say it again. If from law, I'll make up the numbers. If from log n, from log n random bits, you can actually create log squared n poly random bits and that's good enough for the PCP. So it's like using uh, expander graphs, yeah. like say, say the random functions with yes. seed. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I, 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 let me say it more, more carefully. We use a pseudo random generator, which takes log n truly random bits and expands it into log squared n poly random bits. And into this particular pseudo random generator uses expander graphs. Okay, nice. Okay, very good. Okay, more thoughts. Uh, hi, I, I want to make sure that- Okay, sorry, sorry, let, let me put it, back, put it back on. Okay, sorry about that. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, can I see the slides? Okay, the last slide you want? Uh, the, the last one? Yeah, there you go. I just want to make sure that uh, here the error probabilities, I hear that one half the epsilon and one over n. Yes. So uh, those are for the no instances, right? Like for, for yes instances, we we can like succeed with probability one. Is that the assumption? Well, no, if you think it's not quite, it's, it's a matter of Bob being fooled. Um, all, it's all the way around. If, if it's satisfiable, you can't fool Bob. Bob is going to accept. If it's not satisfiable, the probability that Bob makes an error is less than equal to one over n, say. Remember, oh, before, remember before with, with satisfiability, for example, we had that, um, we had that if the problem is satisfiable, the probability that Bob will will actually be right is one. If for, for, for probability is not satisfiable, the probability that Bob is right is uh, Bob is sorry. If yeah, uh, pro, Bob Bob might make a probability. Yeah, sorry, all the way around. If phi is sat- if form is satisfiable, the probability Bob is wrong is going to be zero. He'll say yes, he's right. If phi is not satisfiable, the probability Bob is uh, wrong. We want it to be small. I see. Okay. Good, very good. More thoughts? Okay, I want to go on that next slide packet. I don't want somebody saying, go back, so ask now. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, can we have the slides? What's that? Can, can we have the slides at the end? Oh, uh, certainly, yes. Oh, in fact, yes, uh, in fact, tell you what, let me actually, um, right now, I'll put it in the chat. And I, I don't know, if, I don't know how it works the uh, website, of course, but for now, I'll just put it in the chat. It's funny, I can't, modern technology, I can't simultaneously put it in the chat while doing a slideshow. So let me, let me unshare, put it in the chat, put the next one in the chat and then share again. But okay, so then we'll see now. Yeah, okay, I just put these slides in the chat and let me, uh, let me get the next slide, 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 slide in the chat as well. Um, Okay. Oops. Chat. Yeah, here is the next packet. Okay, very good. Okay. And um ah, okay, I should have done it earlier because that way you can actually um go ahead or behind as you see fit. Okay, anyway, so yeah, the next slide packet is the previous one that you just saw and the one I'm gonna show you now are both now in the chat. Um and let me get to Right. Thank you very much. Very good. Very good. Okay. So, um, good. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Here is, and by the way, I will say the last packet of slides, frankly, it wasn't that hard. You just have to define things carefully. <laughs> Cute thing. I didn't prove anything. So <laughs> now I'll prove things. And after all that prelude, the proof's not that hard. So um, here's the point. I want to do lower bounds approximations of clique. 
via PCP and what are called gaps. Okay. Um, so first off, some notation. Uh, G is a graph. Oh, now you're back. You just spent uh, you just spent about uh, oh gosh 30, 50 minutes on complexity theory. We're now back to what you know and love, which is actually lower bounds on approximations. Okay, G is a graph. Omega of G is the max clique in G. Fine. Okay. Uh, assume P is on NP. Given G, I want to find the clique number. As you know, that's hard. But question. Well, um, let's just say that. Um, that we'll see that uh, Amin says to me, well, I couldn't solve clique, but I have an algorithm that outputs a number at least half the clique size. So if the graph had a clique of size 1,000, I can at least tell you it has a clique of size 500. That'd be good. Uh, no, he can't do that. It's, a, it's, a, it's an easy exercise that that would imply people's NP. Well, what if Amin is humble or humble and says, what about 1 over 84 omega of G? No, also an exercise that you can't do. Or again, if you could do that, then P equals NP. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I mean, how about this one? Can you give me a number of size at least one over N omega of G? What do you think? Probably not. Uh, actually, how big can omega of G be? What is oh. it? Uh, oh. oh, it can it can only be N, so then I can give you just a constant. Yeah, output one. That's, that, however, yeah. that is, I, mean, I mean, I can see why you said what you said, but yeah, the answer is yes, but for a dumb reason. Okay, that, that would, you would call that a pathetic approximation algorithm, correct? Of course. Yes. Now, okay, how about just a little bigger log n over n? Uh, what are your guesses? Is there an algorithm for this? What are your thoughts? I'll take anybody. Just, just any one person, give me, a, give me a guess. Or peek ahead and, and, and guess that way. Come on, folks, what do you think? Yeah, well, I'll tell you because I want to move on. It turns out it is known. This is actually a, a respectable, yeah, I mean, your theorem, item three, is a pathetic theorem not worth publishing. Four is actually a pathetic bound, but it's still hard and, and people could do it. I mean, the, the, I mean, log over n is a pathetic uh, algorithm, yet, can we do better is the question. Um, okay. Can we do one over root n omega of g? What do you think? Uh, I'll probably guess no, because this is a hardness class. Fair enough. <laughs> that is, first off, that is absolutely a valid way of reasoning about things, and you are correct. Yeah. Actually, you can't do this. I'm not going to quite show this. I will show something close to this, but yes, in fact, um, you can't do n to the one half omega of g. And in fact, you can't do um, n to the, uh, let's see, what's, what's, bigger, what's better going, upper, uh, bigger, small? Oh, yeah. yeah, n to the point nine, one over n to the point nine you can't do. Essentially, any other one you can't do. I won't do that. I'll prove this, there exists a delta that you can't do. And um, so it means that algorithm four, pathetic as it is, is about optimal. Yeah, so, uh, wow, scary. But, but again, it's uh, good to know. Okay. Now, okay, uh, so here's my theorem. There exists a delta less than one, such that if some algorithm does do one over n of the delta omega of g, then p equals np. So happy with the statement. Okay, and we'll pick delta later. Oh, okay, I'll tell you now, actually. Delta, when I say pick delta, it's not quite fair. Delta will be a parameter coming out of the PCP machinery I do not know if anyone ever really ever calculated delta. There were better results later, so there's no, no real need. But again, it's it comes as bur it's buried in the machinery of, of those theorems. Okay. Okay. First off, uh, assume assume we have such an algorithm. We'll just call that the approx because I, I I first called it like A or Al. Now nah, the approx is good enough. So there is an approx algorithm. Fine. We will derive a value of delta that gives p equals np. Okay. Uh, okay, so let A be an NP. By the PCP theorem, there's a C and a D. We're going to be very concrete now. So that A can be in PCP C log N, D log N, 1 over N. Okay, let me see. Okay, good. Now, uh, I'm going to linger here for a bit. So we now have two things we can use to get an algorithm for, not for clique, but for actually for A. A is an NP set, perhaps set. We can take it to be satisfiability. That's not hell. Take it to be in any particular, but fine, satisfiability. And A has a PC. We have two things. We have 
an approximation algorithm for a clique, and we have a PCP protocol for A. We're going to use these two together to obtain a algorithm for a clique. And uh, that will, I mean, for the, for the actual clique problem, and since clique is actually NP complete, sorry, back up. We're going to use these two to get an algorithm for A. And since A is anything in NP, including, for example, satisfiability possibility, we'll have P equals NP. This is probably the most important slide in this lecture. So I want to really make sure you understand that because before this slide it was all definitions. After it's all proofs, this is sort of the linchpin that really uh, is the, really, you know, telling you what we're going to do. So I'm, I'm going to stop here for a bit and ask your questions on it or thoughts on it. I'll be happy with this. It's not, it's not, it's not that it's hard, but that, that's important. I have a question regarding the Delta. Yes. Do we know its value? I mean, uh, good question. Uh, at the, uh, I will, during the proof, I will derive a delta that makes it work. Yeah, I'll pick delta during the proof itself. Okay, thanks. But yes, and um, I'll tell you right now, it'll depend on C and D. So it'll depend on the details of the PCP proof. Right. More thoughts. Okay. Uh, by the way, as for driving delta during the proof, I kind of like doing that. Realize, by the way, I believe you're all grad students doing research and stuff. This is not math. Math is always presented a little too cleanly. That is, um, this is, what I'm doing is how math is really done. We don't know delta ahead of time. We do the proof and figure out delta that works. Whereas math paper is taught to say they state a theorem and don't quite know where the parameters came from. Here you'll know. Okay. So, um, Everyone's happy with what I'm going to do. I'm going to take these two items and use them to get an algorithm for A. Okay. Now, uh, preparation for the algorithm. Oh, boy. So X is 0, 1 to the N. We want to know if X is an A. Okay. We can simulate the PCP on X given all possible query answers and random bits. Remember, uh, we did have uh, C log N and D log N so 2 to the c log n plus d log n is still polynomial. So we can indeed um, simulate x on all the query answers and random bits. So happy with that. OK, um, sigma will be in 0, 1 to the c log n. That will be used for the queries. Tau is in 0, 1 to the d log n. That will be used for the random bits. OK. So we can simulate the PCP on X with sequence sigma tau. And it will either accept or reject. Fair enough. So we do this. Uh, and I'll, I'll say we will simulate the PCP on every single sigma tau sequence. We will keep track of two things. One, whether it accepts or rejects. And also, what queries it asked, what the answers were. So we simulate PCP on, ah, and in fact, if I simulate it on two different sequences, either um, there's some query they answered differently, so they're inconsistent, as I said earlier, or for all queries in common, they answer the same, that would be consistent. So are you happy that I can do this? Okay. So with that in mind, here is my algorithm for A. I think it's just, after all this talk, I think it's just one slide. Okay, input x, we'll assume x to the power of 2. Not a big deal. And we're wondering, is x, is x an a? Form a graph g. Okay, we're going to form a graph g, and looking ahead, we'll be looking at the approximate algorithm on, on g. The vertices are going to be all sequences sigma tau in 0, 1 of the c log n plus d log n. So that's n to the c plus d poly psi. So the vertices are going to be all these different um, query uh, query bits, random bits that we're thinking of simulating. The edge is the following. I'll put sigma tau, sigma prime tau prime, and E if both simulations accept and the pair is consistent. Okay. So before I go on, this is probably my second most important slide of the day because this is the actual connection between uh, PCPs and cliques. So are we happy with this graph?
Okay, and a question for you. Um, before the, the next point is going to be what happens if x is in a and x is not in a? You tell me. If x is in a, then what do you know about this graph? Again, you can probably guess it has to do with clique size, but if x is an A, what will that tell you about cliques in this graph? I'm waiting. Okay, well, if x is an A, there's a consistent way to answer the queries. So there's some tau, the query bits, and so that x on tau accepts, which means that the um, every single random sequence will say yes. So fix tau. Now look at all the random sequences. That will form a, they will all be consistent with each other and say yes. That'll be end of the D clique. So this is very important. If x is in A, there's a clique of size end of the D. This I really want your feedback on. Make sure you're understanding it. I'll say it again. If x is in A, then there's some fixed tau uh, that actually does accept. So tau with any random sequence will actually accept. And therefore, there are um, how many random sequences? Are there are C log n. Um, yeah, there are D log n random sequences. And therefore, you'll actually have an end of the D size clique. So are we happy with this? If X is not an A, then any consistent way to answer queries that makes, uh, well, there can't be a way to answer a lot of queries consistently because um, again, I'm skipping details here. If there is some way to answer the queries consistently, and I'm also, yes, if, if, sorry, then yeah, if X is not an A, and look at the graph. Aha, the graph can't have a large clique because if X is not an A, then you then most so, quote most unquote of the random sequences lead to not accepting. That is, if X is not an A, then for any um, for any uh, sequence of query bits, you're going to have most of the uh, most of the random bit sequences following it are not going to accept. And therefore, you really can't have a large clique. So I'm skipping details of 3.2, but the idea is if X is in A, you have a large clique. If X is not in A, you can't have a large clique. If X is in A, you have a clique of size at least end of the D. If X is not in A, then your largest clique is of size at most end of D minus one. Okay. So, okay. So are we happy with that? Again, skipping details, you see what I'm saying here, though, that if X is in A, the graph has a large clique. X not in A, it can't have a large clique. Um, why can't there still be a clique formed by like different values of sigma like being connected? Because okay, they would still be consistent with each other. The thing is, if you had different sigma, okay, that, that is different. You're saying different query bits? Yeah. The thing is, if two things are consistent, then yeah, if you had a large, if you had a large set of, if you had a large clique um, using different sigmas, say, they're actually the same sigma. If, the, if you're only asking about, you, know, you can actually get those sigmas together into one sigma that works. Like, ah, he's asking about bits 1, 3, and 12. He has about, about bits 3, 12, and 84. He's asking about bits uh, 3, 97, 84, whatever. The thing is, though, they can be made into one consistent query, uh, query sequence. Do you see that? Um. A large clique would mean, yeah, I'll say it again, then I want your feedback. If, if I have a large clique of, say, I'll call it, uh, let me see now, sig, um, yeah, sigma one, tau one, sigma two, tau one, sigma three, tau two, uh, tau three, whatever. Thing is, though, um, if you have a large clique, it means you have a large set of things that all are consistent with each other. And if you have a large set of nodes where the query sequences are consistent, you can take those, diff those so to speak, different query sequences and merge them into one. That is, this guy asked about 17, this guy didn't. So even if they, dis uh, yeah, and therefore, uh, there's no conflict. But yes. then couldn't that be more than log n size? And um, uh, let's see, no, uh, no, it cannot, let's see now. Could they more than log n size? No, because every individual sequence is log n size. 
you would have a lot. You would have lots of different login sequences that uh, that only okay that actually agree on all the places they ask questions. There may be some bit that never asked. It may be okay. It may be that this sequence would have said no on seventeen, and this sequence would have said yes on seventeen, but neither simulation asked about seventeen. And they, and therefore and therefore they are consistent with each other. Realize when I say two sequences are consistent, what I mean is that when they actually um, when they're actually run, they never conflict. And so if two if two different sequences when they actually run never give different answers, then I can essentially make it into one sequence. One larger sequence. What's that? One larger sequence. Uh, it would be larger because the thing is, though, uh, the thing is, though, they didn't ask certain things. Okay, the thing is, realize I will. I okay. I let's say okay. There are two different view. Hmm, let me actually say this another way. Uh, for, 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 this is actually very good. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad we're here, get, get, getting back to me on asking questions. Um, there are okay. Let me. It's a subtle point. We're going to two different ways to think about sequences. If I have a sequence 00110, that means, oh, the first query I come across, I answer 0 to. Next one, I answer 1 to. So take that sequence. So I have a sequence which lends to the first bit of some way, second bit, et cetera. I then have a different, and that might end up asking about uh, 17, 84, and 37. Something else does the same thing. The thing is, I may end up asking the same questions. So the thing is, once you do that, um, yeah, if I have two different sequences that are consistent, um, then again, all that matters is that they are consistent. All that matters is that I have two, yeah, all that matters is that I, I can now view it, instead of viewing it as being answer the first question, yes, the question, no, I can now view it as saying answer 17, yes, 84, no. And that's going to be not that many questions. Realize every single simulation asks at most uh, C log n, uh, whatever, C log n, log n questions. So not that many. More thoughts on this? Okay. And the nice thing is that we have this nice big gap keyword, end of the D, clique of size, at least end of the D versus clique of size at most and D minus one. Okay. So our, so our first big concept was you can turn a PCP into a graph problem, into a clique problem. Our next thing is going to be this nice gap of n to the d versus n to the d minus 1. So run the approximation algorithm on g. And um, if, if x is an a, then the uh, graph, or then I have a big clique. Uh, and if I have a big clique, then the approximation algorithm is going to actually give me an answer of at least n to the d minus c plus d delta. That is, if x is in a, then not only is the clique large, but the approximation algorithm gives me a pretty large number. If x is not in a, then the clique is small, and the approximation algorithm, it could be as good as it size itself, the approximation algorithm is going to be get to return to me n to the minus one. So item three said x in a large clique, x not in a, small, small, small largest clique. Item four is going to say x and a, the approximation algorithm even, gives me a pretty large number. x not in a gives me a small number. So I now have this gap here. Now, um, I would like to have that you can't get in between these two. I would like to have that exactly one of 4.1 or 4.2 holds. So what do I need? I need to have that... Um, D minus one, the small clique, is less than D minus C plus T delta. And that gives me that delta has to be chosen less than one over C plus D. So um, given step three, which maybe some kind of questions about, do you see step four? And step four will tell me that, aha, if I pick delta less than one over C plus D, then step four gives me this gap. And therefore, I can differentiate X in A from X not in A. Are we happy with that? Are you happy with that? Your thoughts? 
because I'm asking now, because I'm going to go to the, go to the next slide. Okay. So, the so can, the, approx can the approximation not give you a bigger ans uh, answer, bigger than your actual it's answer? Which is, which is why, uh, oh, the, no, the approximation can't give an answer. It can't give an answer bigger than omega of j. Oh, the approximation algorithm gives you an answer that's, yeah, good, good question. Approximation algorithms, in this case, always give you an answer at most omega of j, and usually less than that. Yeah, we assume approximations because the thing is, usually uh, approximation algorithms also produce the clique for you. So we haven't really gotten this detail, but I've been using the size of the clique as the actual problem. Really, it's the size of the clique and the clique itself. So um, an approximation algorithm is going to give you the size of the clique and the clique itself, and therefore can never give you something bigger than omega of g. Okay. Okay. Okay, so with that in mind, is step four clear then? Okay. Okay. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry, 9 11. I better, I better hurt now. Okay, okay, so, um, so to finish it up, we now say if the approximation algorithm outputs a number at least n of the d minus c plus d delta, I'll put yes. And if it outputs a number less than that, I'll put no. And by our comments, no other case will occur. Okay, so um, the time is almost out now. So what I'll do is I'll stop pretty soon. And next lecture, I'll actually resume back a few slides and answer, answer some of your questions you had before. But I'll be happy with this, though. I'll be happy with the general idea. So I want to recap what the algorithm did. And I'll, I'll recap it again next week and go further as well. So, um, so the, the really yeah. key, go ahead. Is there, is there a question or a thought? No, uh, thanks, Bill. Yeah. So you want to go through the, yeah. I think if it's a type of gap, things that we are discussing a lot, that there's a gap essentially in the yeah. Yeah. approximation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, the important, yeah, that's right. So I want to reiterate two things here. So the key to the algorithm, the key to this one page algorithm is for one, for one thing, turning a PCP of A into a clique problem. And secondly, making the approximation to a clique problem, which is a big, small problem, a gap problem even on step three. You either get a small clique or a large clique. And then if you, have, if you have a large clique, small clique differentiation, then an approximation algorithm will still preserve that large and smallness. And therefore, you can actually get an algorithm for X and A. Okay. So um, I will actually start next lecture, even maybe on this slide, uh, slide before it, and go, 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 and go further. But are there thoughts on any more questions, though? I do have one more question. Go ahead. Uh, do we know if this delta is optimal? Oh, ah, good question. No, in fact, it, it is not. There, there were later much, there are later much, much better results. In fact, um, yeah. Um, oh, let me go back to, yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah, here. Remember I said that, uh, can we do n of the one over ha one half the omega of g? I showed you there's some delta that exists, and I don't know what it is. It's buried in the machinery. Yeah. Later on, people got n, one over n to the point nine, one over n to the point nine nine. In fact, essentially any epsilon you can't do one over n to the one minus epsilon. So harder proofs did get better results, which are essentially optimal. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, very good. Okay, so more thoughts. Okay, very good. Then Mohammed can shut off the recording and I'll see you on Thursday. Yeah, so yeah. Bye, -bye. bye for now. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, okay, good.